right, you've tuned in to Davis Media Access again, and we're here tonight with another episode of The City Considers. My guests tonight are City Council members Lucas Frerichs and Brett Lee, and we are here to revisit the proposed renter's ordinance here in Davis. Welcome, Lucas. Welcome, Be Brett. We, it was about a year ago you guys were in here and we were talking about this, and at the time it was an idea. Right. And it was an idea that I remember you were very passionate about, and... Uh, some things have happened since, so you're here to give us an update today. Yeah. So do you want me to start? Yeah, uh, go ahead sure. and start off. Yeah. So actually, the council voted 5-0 uh, last fall, actually, to uh, go ahead and implement uh, a renter's ordinance. And so um, as some of the people may recall, there were sort of three main components to it. Right. Uh, maybe Lucas wants to list off a couple, and we can maybe give some examples of how that might actually help uh, real, wor real world renters and landlords and also just uh, general uh, neighbors. Sure. Let me yeah. back up one second, too. Sure. We were at, I remember we talked about the things that were driving your concerns about this, and it was a, a very low vacancy rate, um, the fact that there were a, a proportionally a pretty high number of single family rental um, dwellings in Davis, those sorts of things. So yeah. what's happened in the interim? So the, the ordinance is really three main major comport components, excuse me. So uh, the first is sort of an educational component. So there's uh, uh, going to be a city website that is do uh, dedicated to sort of renters' rights and, and responsibilities and all those types of things. Uh, it also will be helpful for tenants, but also for landlords and, uh, and you know individuals and neighbors in the community as well, too. Mm -hmm. uh, but also there is a registration component to the ordinance, <clears throat> and then also, uh, what is our third component inspection. The, oh, the inspection yeah that's yeah. of course uh, so you know I think that uh, we've got three major components the where we're at today though is that the city is in the process of hiring uh, an individual to basically run this new program mm -hmm. uh, and so that process is we're almost close to completion we're almost ready to uh, to have that person in place to start to implement the, the new program so Oh, happy to be more specific and give you more details, but that's the sort of yeah. overall. Yeah. So, so the person is a, will be a part-time person, mm -hmm. and related to kind of uh, you know the, the the challenges that we face in the city of Davis with this very low vacancy rate yeah. and also very high proportion of first-time renters, mm -hmm. um, the education component is supposed to address that. And okay. so we have, you know, somebody who's 20 years old and doesn't really know what their rights and responsibilities mm -hmm. are. And so we're formalizing the process a little more so that when people register their properties um, with the city, and the registration fees are very modest. It's uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of, let's say, $30 for a single family mm -hmm. residential unit for the year. And for apartment complexes, per complex, the maximum is $100 for the entire complex okay. for the year. Yeah. So, um, you know, if it were a 100 unit complex, that would basically work out to $1 per unit per year for the registration. And the reason why there's, um, it's a fairly low registration expense is because the fees um, are aggregated and really once you put a website up the fact that lots of people make use of it or uh, we are going to have a little kiosk at City Hall once you put it up the incremental cost of each additional unit um, isn't that much right. and so uh, a first time renter will come in and sort of better understand what their rights and responsibilities are and as Lucas mentioned uh, we want also a landlord component because um, as you kind of referenced in your uh, opening about a third of the single-family homes in Davis, mm -hmm. uh, so not apartments buildings, but single-family homes are being rented out. And a lot of those people are first-time landlords and relatively new at it. And so there's also a lot of, uh, there's a need for better education yeah, for the absolutely. landlord component. And so people will be able to go and sort of better understand, you know, what their rights and responsibilities are. And so that's a, a big important piece. And we also, we have the Sacramento Housing Association, mm -hmm. which is a trade association for essentially uh, apartment owners. They are going to help with the education component and uh, they are very supportive of our ordinance because it's a, a fairly reasonable step. Mm -hmm. and it sounds like education is really key to this, and it's true. I remember moving out of the dorms, getting my first apartment here in town. I, I didn't know how to rent an apartment. I didn't right. know what I was responsible for. I didn't really know what to do when something broke. So there's all of that. But as you said, first-time 
uh, landlords or property managers, right. they may not yeah. also know that either. Yes. I do remember last year talking about there, there was going to be a requirement that um, there had to be a responsible party within 50 miles yes. um, yeah. instead of being an out-of-state landlord. That's and, correct. And yeah. so has that, has that been written into the process? Uh, yes. Yeah. And the idea, there is an exemption that somebody could petition to have somebody who's uh, slightly farther away, but that will require a, a specific request. Okay. But the default is that people need to be in the approximate area and they need to be available uh, seven days a week, 24 hours a day right. to respond to emergency issues. Yeah, that's, you know, I think <clears throat> that's one of the real keys that right now in the city we don't have, you know, the city doesn't, uh, you know, possess any kind of database, right, and sort of a comprehensive database that where we know who owns what properties. Right. So, and this is actually one of the benefits to to neighbors, frankly, is that neighbors have an, right now, you know, they can go to the tenants of a house and say, you know, I need to t speak to your landlord or whatever, but that's not that information is not necessarily readily available. Right. So, requiring each single family home, you know, uh, that's a rental to be registered with mm -hmm. the city, uh, will will also help facilitate interactions with the neighbors as well too. Aside. It, of course, in addition to uh, tenants, uh, you know that may have you know needs, of course, and also if the city has needs, to be in t contact with um, the property owner. So, uh, it's a really uh, you know pretty positive uh, sort of component to the ordinance. The other thing I would mention is you know one of the reasons also that you know aside from the very low vacancy rate in Davis right now, uh, you know almost basically zero vacancy rate. Uh, you know one of the other issues is that we're the only college town, uh, you know university town in California that doesn't have some type of ordinance like this in place. Is that right? Yeah, I mean. So you know all the other UC towns do, uh, and then many other college towns in California, and actually many many t communities in California have something uh, you know some sort of renters type ordinance in place. Uh, but particularly in terms of the college towns, we're the only one that didn't have something like this in place. So, so you did have resources to help you kind of model our ordinance off of. Absolutely, yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Our, our ordinance is modeled after uh, a sort of amalgamation of a number of them, but including you know what's in place in Sacramento and Sacramento County as right. an example too, right. close by. What kind of feedback have you been getting both from, I know you've talked to a lot of renters, you've also, I imagine, talked to a lot of property managers and property yeah. holders. So a lot of the, the renters are pretty excited. We had a, uh, a statement of support from the ASCCD mm -hmm. and uh, we had a lot of students come down and you know, say that you know, they're really looking, that this is something that the town has needed for a while. And in general, we've had a lot of positive uh, responses from people when they uh, learn about the mediation component. Because right now, there aren't mediation services uh, available through the city to help diffuse some issues. Right. And one of the related to the education component is uh, mediation services that we plan to offer. So that can be between roommates, right? Mm -hmm. Like, hey, mm -hmm. you were supposed to pay the electricity. I thought you did. And, and now there's some weird right. conflict going on. Right. And then there's uh, between uh, tenants and neighbors and tenants and landlords because right now the process has sort of the, in the current situation, you can go and you can, hey, Autumn, I'm having this issue. Yeah. And if one of us just kind of folds our arms and goes, no, nope, not interested, the next level is really the legal level. That's how people end up in court. Yes, right. Yeah. basically small claims yeah. court. Small claims exactly. court. And that's like a giant step from just trying to work it out to that level. And so the mediation is meant to just uh, step in a little earlier in the process before mm -hmm. things get too out of hand and really provide some guidance. And the mediators will be tr trained in uh, tenant law, so yeah. they will not just be there to you know, try to make people feel good. They'll right. be grounded in what the law is. And we also, that, that component of the, uh, the ordinance is actually, uh, it's a great partnership between the city, but also uh, the uh, YOLO Conflict Resolution Center, yeah. YCRC, a newer, a newer nonprofit <laughs> yeah. you know, here in YOLO yeah. County. It's yeah. uh, made up of a lot of folks who've been involved in this type of work for many, many years, but uh, you know, I think it's a real great. You know, the city does not have the ability to uh, sort of have this sort of in-house services be provided. So we're work partnering with uh, an existing nonprofit, YOLO uh, Conflict Resolution Center (YCRC) mm -hmm. to actually work on uh, that component too. Which so yeah. you know, it's taking uh, a nonprofit that's already you know an, uh, sort of experts in their field yep. and, and partnering with the city and getting getting them put to good use. That's it's something really I always like to hear. About. In yeah. terms of the feedback from sort of landlords and property owners. Right. Uh, initially, there was a, a lot of concern. Um, right now, there are no specific city regulations related to kind of the rental housing market. Right. Most of those are done 
through health and safety regulations at the county level. We have some building code sort of regulations at the city level, the county level, and the state level. But in terms of actually regulating the renter, kind of a landlord-renter relationship, there isn't anything. And as Lucas alluded to, uh, or specifically mentioned, all the other UC campuses, uh, typically, there's right. something there. And so they were kind of used to not having to worry about it. And so the initial reaction was uh, great concern. But as they, uh, we brought them into the process and sort of laid out what we were planning, um, the majority of them are fairly comfortable with it. And while they may prefer to just let uh, not have them and just sort of leave it to them to work out the, the issues, right. um, most sort of came on board with understanding that this is a fairly reasonable step mm -hmm. and it should still preserve their ability to operate their businesses um, in a professional manner. And so just to recap, property managers and landlords will pay a modest fee yes. every year that, that will register them. Those fees will help fund this part-time position through the, the city. Yes. And then they also have access to things like mediation and education. So there's a clear yes. benefit to them yes. as well yes. as as renters. Exactly. Right. And then there's one other piece that's uh, related to single family residential only, and that's an inspection component. Mm -hmm. yeah. So apartment complexes are just purpose built to be used as rentals. Whereas the person who takes their single family home and rents it out to eight students, it's not really purpose built for that. And so we heard a lot of anecdotal complaints and concerns about the condition of the rental property and was it really um, suitable. Right. Uh, or livable, yeah. Or, you know, habitable. Habitable, yeah. And so because of the very low vacancy <clears throat> rate, many people have uh, um, talked to us about it. They're very, very concerned about complaining about uh, living conditions. Sure, because they, then when they're, where are they going to live? Right. right? So yeah. they don't want to be troublemakers because then the landlord will kick them out and they'll just find somebody else who comes in and isn't interested And in you mentioned something, Brett, about uh, you know a house with, with eight students. So sure. how does this ordinance connect to or relate to or does it to the, the city's mini dorm ordinance? Is it an ordinance? So we're working on a mini dorm ordinance. Yeah. Uh, the state, we, that's going to be a fairly tricky one yeah. because the state has ruled that we can't limit the number of people who live in a home in what you would consider to be kind of a, a meaningful way. I think the requirement is that each person has like 45 square feet of living space. I mean, it's very, very small. So if you think of a 2,000 square foot home or a 1,000 square foot home, literally you could put uh, you know 20 people in yeah. before you hit the limits that the state has imposed. Wow. And understand, this: the state ruling was done for a reasonable, um, for, for a good reason in a sense. What you had is you had some people living in a neighborhood and they didn't like the fact that, oh, somebody moved in and they have a big family or they have family, extended family, and they were trying to limit sort of that. Sure, and right. you legitimately had, you know, a family of 12 people living in a house. Well, yeah, that, that should be allowed. That should be allowed, right? <laughs> yeah. And so they were trying to approach it from requiring a certain amount of square footage per person. So the state sort of responded by uh, a fairly small amount. Um, so in terms of the mini dorm ordinance, we're still in the process of working on it. And I think the direction we're going on that will have to do with not so much limiting the number of people, but limiting the externalities to the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So the house with you know 12 cars, the house with uh, um, you know sort of violating some of the, gotcha. the building code types so of there's things. There's a lot more layers to that one, but yeah. I, I yeah. was curious how it connected to this. We actually have just a couple oh, yeah. more minutes, so sort of final thoughts so we can sure. wrap this up. Uh, just one thing I would say is that also you know one thing that was really important to the council uh, when going through this process and we unanimously agreed to this was you know a re regular check-ins. You know, so mm -hmm. this pro this is a brand new ordinance for the city, brand new. Uh, sort of, you know, proposal and uh, that we're setting up, program we're setting up, and so there is, you know, regular check-in scheduled. So, you know, we will uh, soon have this individual hired that will be running, right. administering the program for the city, and be very much a public face in terms of the city staff side of the equation. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, in about a year from now, uh, we will have a check-in uh, at the city council as sort of, you know, once we're because the real key is we want to actually gather a bunch of data. 
you know, over the course of the next year uh, and make sure that we have a robust, uh, you know, not only database of the rental properties, but also see what types of complaints we're getting, see what types of, you know, right. also uh, compliments as well, too, hopefully. Right. Uh, yeah. But we, we really want to make sure that we want to, you know, see it, that it's working. So. so does this have any uh, additional path through council, any any additional votes that need to happen on it? No, or it's, it's, it's a done deal. It's, uh, yeah. You're ready to, ready to hire? To and, yeah. Yeah. Fin the final vote was, you know, started in the fall, and then it, and then the final vote was basically right around February 1st in that range. So yeah. it is now, uh, in you know, the ordinance is in effect, and uh, we're just going through the hiring process, as we said, just to finalize that person, get it, get the final pieces of the program okay. in, in place. Yeah. Local governance in action. Yeah. We talked about this less than a year ago, and yep. here it is, and it's it's in place. So, yeah. well, thanks for that. Thanks for coming in today, for too, sure. and making time. I want to remind viewers that uh, the City of Davis has a website, cityofdavis.org. There's a link there for city council agendas. You can watch them streaming online. You can watch them on uh, local Comcast Channel 16. And they're archived, and you can get all sorts of information. You can get in touch with council members that way, too. Thanks for tuning in. This is the City Considers here at Davis Media Access.